Judy is an amazing lady. Uh, she's currently the Chancellor of the University of Vedvatistrand. That is a great achievement. Let's just look at her. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, people who have been impacted by vets. I'm one of them. And I, I work at business school now as an executive in resident. And uh, it's an amazing institution, that one. Keria, she's a founder, um, an executive chairman of Mbegani group, which includes operations in health, property, facilities, management, and luxury fashion retail. Am I right that that's shop? Uh, uh, what is it? Luminous. And TV too. So ladies, uh, if you want something nice and boutique, say uh, <laughs> advertise, I'm going to advertise. <laughs> uh, that is now, she, she runs that shop, She's, uh, she owns it. And also want to advertise her book, Equal But Different, am I right? Uh, it's outside here, please get that book. It will be a great uh, help for you. And uh, it, this organization of her started as a consultancy with two employees in 1996, and now it employs more than 150 people. That's job creation. Wow, man. We need, we need every job in South Africa. She's also Lynette, and which is a, why we invite people at the ULP. She's a doctor, medical doctor by profession, you know, not PhD, doctor. You see, during the time when we grew up, when you go to a doctor, he used to give you an injection. And I still want an injection when I go to a doctor. So she can give you an injection. But not only that, she's done DOH at UFS, done an MBA at VITS, Doctors and doctor in business leadership in UNISA. So she's not only an MBCH as a doctor medical, she's also doctor academically. Yeah, wonderful, man. That's great. <laughs> she also spent time overseas in Stanford University and did a, an innovation and entrepreneurial certificate. She's held a number of directorship. Previously, she was a chair of a Johannesburg listed uh, company, Aspen Pharma Care. And she's been in boards on a number of companies, including Anglo America. When you see PLC, it means global. It's not PLC, PTY South Africa. <laughs> just, 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 you know, we're learning all the time. It's important. So she's been on a global platform, Discovery Holdings, Woolworths. We had the chairman of Woolworths here, so it's great. And the vets, uh, Donald Gordon Medical Center. Not only is she an academic, she mean an academic, you know, she's chasing me. She said, no, nah, stop it now, stop it now. <laughs> she, she's humble. <laughs> uh, she's a co-founder of a, a, a trust, which is doing a lot of community work uh, on behalf of the family. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. San Bonan. Dumelang, good evening. Um, oh, thank you. So I can, great. Okay, great. Um, I just want to thank the Khadebe family. I've met the two daughters. I've met the queen, Mrs. Khadebe. Siabonga Roma Kulukulu for putting this together, uh, which is priceless for the future of our country. Uh, for future leaders, and even people like myself. There's so much to learn. I would like to acknowledge the princess from Royal Bafogeng. Um, they do amazing work, as you may or may not know, the school and so many other things that I, I wish I could write about because I think the more we share the positive about us is the more we emulate that positive because we are greater than people tell us and it's our responsibility therefore to tell each other how great we are. Uh, I would like to recognize the executive team of uh, ULP. Uh, yeah, um, I was asked to chat to you informally. Now, as Morris said earlier on, I'm his senior. 
Uh, I was at Marine Hill and finished before he came. So when you've lived for many decades, it's easy to waffle and I could keep you for two hours. <laughs> and you don't want that, right? So I said, okay, I'm going to discipline myself. I'll actually have slides to remind me and also to make sure that I talk within what I've been asked to talk about. So, it's a true honor to be here. Uh, my husband came here before I did. Uh, so I'm actually following in his footsteps. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is what I've been asked to share. Uh, just briefly, my upbringing, defining moments, uh, amongst other things. So, it's been a long journey. You can't put it on a slide. But the core of that journey, the core of the person that I am, are those two elders on the screen, my dad and my mom. That toddler who's looking very confused and I think I even look hungry there, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, by the time I got my doctorate, which was a childhood dream, they were both gone. So there's a significance to that picture because I do believe that our ancestors watch over us. I do believe that, especially if you are raised in a Catholic setting and you are told about saints, <clears throat> guys that you don't really know, guys that someone decides because they did well in this part, therefore they become saints. As Africans, we have our own saints. So my religion and my ancestral roots are aligned because those are my saints, right? So everything I am is because of those guys. And it's funny that when you are younger, you don't realize that. The more I look at my journey is the more I realize that actually everything I am is because of these guys. They were hustlers. I'm a hustler. My mother ran away from home to get education because she was raised by a father who was a nice guy, but he didn't believe that a girl child should be given education because she'll get married and leave. So she said, okay, I'll run. She went to a convent and she actually got a teacher's a training a certificate. So looking at how I've pursued education, I realized that I follow in her footsteps. Looking at the journey of uh, starting the private practice, Emla's in the township, opening a bakery with my husband next to my practice, and after that, uh, starting Begani, having Gusa Women Consortium, amongst other things, shows me that I've learned from these guys. Starting a property company, my dad, there were very few areas in, in South Africa. He was born in 1902. So Group Areas Act came after he was born. He was actually quite old when it happened. But there were few areas where blacks were allowed to buy property. He bought property in those areas, built flats, and rented them out. So when I start and began a properties company, I'm learning from him. So I'm simply saying, I don't think there's anything special about me, but everything is special about them because they beat the system and inculcated a value system that made me who I am and do the things that I've been able to do because I saw them do it. I hope you can read that. So, when you talk about defining moments, shoo, there are so many of them. And it depends on what matters to you as to which ones you pick, right? I haven't put the chancellorship of Vits, not because it's not important, but because I love being able 
to change the direction of my life. I like ownership of my journey. Obviously with the guidance of God and his support and my family. So I always see defining moments as the things that I helped navigate and actually land in that defining moment. So that is why I start by talking about realizing my first dream, the MBCHB. But two things happened before then, which are just as important, and I didn't want to crowd the slide. I got married when I was in fourth year medical school, and that's very important to me. And I'll tell you why it's important, especially as I talk to young people. It matters a lot who you choose to marry. Your life partner determines your cause in some aspects. A lot depends on you, but with the support or lack thereof, a lot is affected by your life partner. So that is why it's a defining moment for me. And I started with my parents as the core of who I am, but my partner has contributed a lot on the person that I am today. Now, what are the important things when you look for a partner? It's an alignment of values, right? Love is great and it's very important because it sustains relationships. But if the values are not aligned, there is a challenge. It's a serious challenge. In the past few weeks to a few months, I've been disillusioned, I've been scared, I've been angry. Why? Because of gender-based violence and femicide. As a country, we have the highest rate of femicide, five times the global average. Why am I sharing this? Because in the room I see a lot of young women and young men, and both are equally important in choosing right when you look for relationships and realizing that if the value system is not aligned, maybe you want to get out of that relationship. The next milestone is getting our son when I was in fifth year. And of course, the degree that I went there to do in the first place, the MBCHB. It wasn't without its challenges though, which I think is important to share. It's not like I was number one all the time and as a result I went to medical school and I passed with flying colors. No, I had to repeat two causes. That was hard because if you are able to get admitted to medical school, normally your grades are quite high. That's why you actually make the grade. Then when you fail for the first time at university, it's very humbling. But you know what? I won't change anything because it tested my resilience. I didn't understand the grades that I had until I failed. But also it humbled me. You know, when you actually, when life just goes smoothly and you just do well all the time, you start taking things for granted. Sometimes you need those challenges, the speed bumps along the way to realize that you just flawed like all of us and you, work, you have to work harder, you know, and appreciate what you have. The second milestone is a changing careers. That was very special for me. I had a very successful GP practice, MLAS. Who's from Devon here? Oh, wow, hi. <laughs> Anyone from MLAS? Okay, that's nice. Anyone from Claremont? No, Claremont, oh. <laughs> anyway, so I started my practice, MLAS. There was a trailblazer there, who Dr. Mashalaba, the late Dr. Mashalaba. She's the mother to Ipile Mukari. Uh, she was a trailblazer. She was the first African woman to be a GP in Mlaz. 
it made it easier for the young woman that I was because she had shown that it's possible. You can go to a woman and get treatment. But still, we still had challenges that we continue to have, where you'd have male I mean, patients coming in, you treat them and they refuse to pay just because it's a practice full of women. And all I had to do is to get a security, a male security officer. No gun, nothing. Just the maleness was <laughs> enough, right? Guys, it's sad. We laugh, but we as a country have a challenge. The world has a challenge of seeing women as less of disrespecting women. And I'm relying on your generation working with us to change that. And it doesn't help to talk to a group of women because women don't abuse themselves. Women don't kill themselves. Women are abused by men and killed by men. So we need a conversation as men and women to say, guys, we are equal. We might be different, and the more we value that, the more we respect each other, the better this country will be. So I was robbed outside my practice. And as a result, I lost the passion, I think. I didn't feel secure anymore. My practice was my second home my patients with my family. So I sold the practice and moved to town. And I hated being a GP in town. It wasn't the same. Being a GP in the township meant you see Ingan is a sevukuzake as well banzi, who just come to have a chat with this young female doctor to actually ask you how you do it, and you driving this nice car. So it's possible. I loved that. I appreciated those conversations more than the paying patient. Those kids would just come, have a chat to you, and leave. But you actually drove home feeling I made a difference, right? In town, there was nothing of that. You had guys who were not sick but wanted a medical certificate. And <laughs> it's believable. Nothing annoyed me more than that. Because it challenges two things. It challenges your integrity because you lie. It, challenge, it challenges your hard work. Why would you go to medical school and spend so many years just to be a fraudster. That, can you imagine? It really used to make me mad. So I would drive home. Imagine driving home from Emlazi, thinking, oh, wow, what a beautiful day. And then from that anger, when I was in town, I then said, I have to change direction. This is not life. So I have to learn something else. That's why I did an MBA at Vitz. And it was, quite, it was quite an achievement, partly because I've always been very ambitious. I've always wanted to have a PhD. So when I got a master's, it was like, OK, we're getting there, you know? But also, it enabled me to change direction completely. I was already in business, bakery next to my practice, starting a women's investment company, and so many other things. And I realized at that stage that I had a lot of gaps in my knowledge. And I'm never phased by having gaps in knowledge. Because you know why? You can study and be anything you choose to be. So that's why getting the MBA was so important to me. Of course, it enabled me to change a career. And here is a dream that I only reached at 53, getting a doctorate. That was amazing. And when I started studying towards the doctorate, I thought 
ah, it's just a selfish thing. I've just wanted to be this. But it was amazing that it enabled me to have or achieve a dream that I never thought I had, to be an author. And why did I write the book, which was a conversion of my thesis? I wrote it for bulk mentoring, as explained earlier, which is what ULP is doing. I had the privilege of interviewing amazing women across race and across social class. And their journeys made me reflect on my own journey. There are certain decisions that I took after that venture that were based on what I learned from these women. And it occurred to me that what could be better than sharing this information with the world? Because a book makes you have access to people you'll never meet, but they will read the beautiful stories that are in the book. So that's why I wrote the first book. The second book, one of the things that upsets me, there are two things I hate. I hate inequality. I really do, because poverty has my face and my gender, right? And I hate that because it almost then defines me that I belong there. And I know no one belongs there. So I said, let me write stories about people who look like me, who represent who I am as an African. These people had to have achieved in their personal capacity they should have made a difference in their personal lives and the lives of other people. So I chose these 12 people. And I was actually biased towards men for the second book because for the first book I was biased towards women. And I like a balance because I'm a mother of boys and girls. So those are the things that I like to identify as defining moments. The last one, which I think you can hardly see, means everything to me. When my kids were born, when both of them graduated, and when I became a grandmother. Nothing beats that, nothing. <laughs> Moving on. So, what drives me? I'm a dreamer of note and very ambitious. I have these dreams and when you actually reach the dream, you're like, okay, there has to be something else. So my message here is that one dream is not enough. There is one quotation by uh, Ellen Sirleaf, uh, the pro former president of uh, Liberia. She says, if your dreams don't scare you, there's a problem. Your dreams have to be way outside your capacity. I completely believe in that because that's what has sustained me. I won't bore you with everything that I've written here. I was asked what my passion is. I love learning new things. I just get very excited from learning new things. Somewhere I talk about every decade of my life I've studied towards something. Why? Because the beauty with education is, is that it enables you to be more. I always say to young people, you are enough, but you can be more and do more. Being more and doing more is enabled mainly by education. 
There is no better enabler than that. And what I've learned, there are people that are in my life today because I met them at business school. There are people that are in my life today because I met them at, uh, when I was doing my doctorate. Those networks are very important. My job that allowed me to transition from being a medical doctor in investment banking towards being a businesswoman, I got it through a colleague from business school. So relationships are important. And later on, I'll share one of the people that is in one of my books, what he says about relationships and the importance thereof. This is the other thing that I was asked. The page doesn't have enough space for me to talk about my values. But if I had to fill the whole page with one thing, it would be integrity. It's timeless, it's priceless. No one is going to take you to the Zondo Commission <laughs> because you, ca you, are, you can't be corrupted. You don't, you don't sell your soul for anything. You make money, you lose money. But your name is all you have. And the soul is all that matters because that's what you take with you. So it's so important, integrity and honesty. The other thing that I really value is respect. Giving respect and receiving respect. I always say, it doesn't matter who it is. Your parents should respect you. And if they don't respect you, you have to teach them how to respect you. So respect is up and down. Your kids have to respect you. You may love your kids unconditionally. I could lay my life for my daughter, but that doesn't mean she'll get away with disrespecting me. So respect, mutual respect, is, is, an, an, a no -go, is a non negotiable if you like. Hard work, uh, Makulukulu spoke about the ethic that we learned at Marine Hill. The logo at that place is Ora et Labora, which is Latin for work and pray. You don't work, you don't get much, eh? It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter how much talent you have. Hard work, is just, that's just how it goes if you want to succeed. I get asked so many times, what are the characteristics or one characteristic that I've observed from the people that have succeeded in the life that I've lived, which is kind of long. And if I had to pick one, it's a positive attitude. I've had many challenges in life, and what has sustained me is staying positive in the face of adversity. What informs being positive? It's hope and faith. When you own those two things, even when everything around you is collapsing, you hold on to the faith and the hope that things will be okay. So when as a country, we have a lot of young people that are hopeless, I get worried. Because the worst thing for any human being is being hopeless. Because when you're hopeless, you self-destruct and you distract those around you. So it's our responsibility individually and collectively at whatever age to infuse that hope in the people that we touch every day in our lives. Because infusing hope is paying insurance for the sustenance of our freedom and just a stable economic country. Humility, 
Normally, I put, I put confidence next to humility because especially as a leader, and I believe each one of us is a leader, a leader of self, it's important to be confident, even if you're not feeling that confident, but you need to show confidence. But that has to be very close to being humble because once confidence doesn't have humility close to it, it becomes arrogance. And there is nothing worse than being arrogant because you think you know it all, you have it all, and you don't listen to anyone but yourself, and nothing could be worse. And of course, you have to be resilient. It's a tough life. This year and last year, in my view, has been one of the toughest uh, times, economically, socioeconomically, politically, because of just the challenges that we face as a country. I've also been asked uh, to, what's your purpose in life? Um, living and owning my truth, being authentic, what you see is what you get. There is no other side that when you look and, oh my goodness, you know? So you, you, you don't pretend to be something you're not because it's difficult to sustain it. But my purpose is just trying to be the best I was meant to be. And I do that by investing in myself all the time spiritually, in my body, being healthy, going to the gym, making sure what I eat is right, and having a mind that I nurture through reading, through studying, through listening to other people's ideas. And the soul is one of the things that we neglect, and yet it's so important. So it's a holistic thing to invest in those things so that you are the best you are meant to be and make a difference in other people's lives. I think my biggest purpose in life is making a difference in my life, my family's lives, and the lives of the communities that nurtured me and continue to nurture me. That's my purpose. What type of a leader are you? In my view, leadership is service. It's selfless service of the people that you lead. It is owning the decisions that you make. It is being humble enough to recognize the mistakes that you make. It's being a cheerleader. Find the best in each person, because no one has nothing to offer. Everyone has something to offer. As a leader, your job is to find that, nurture it, and make the person aware that, wow, you're good at this, right? Because sometimes as leaders, we are so focused on finding what's wrong about a person instead of looking at what's good. And then you cover the weaknesses by getting other people that make the team a formidable team because you're bringing different strengths to the team. So when you talk about diversity, it's not just diversity of gender or social identities per se, though it's important, but it's also diversity in terms of strengths in terms of personalities. What matters to me as a leader is an inclusive culture. As a country, the government has tried so hard to make sure you have rules, you have legislation that says you'll have so many women, you'll have so many blacks, and whatever else. And as a result, as business, all we do is tick boxes. We bring these brilliant human beings. But because we haven't been conscious of 
seeing peoples as equal. We actually think you are defined by your social identity, which is race or social class or your gender, your sexual orientation. We block ourselves from getting to know the person who's equal, just different. So we comply with the legislation of the country, but we don't use the people that we've invested money to employ by making the culture inclusive. The thing about a culture that is inclusive is that it allows yourself to be. You cannot be innovative. You cannot perform at your best if you actually try to be something you are expected to be. If you have to wear this mask each time you walk into the office because you can't be your true self, everyone loses. So I think as leaders, we have an obligation to make the culture inclusive. So I've been asked to talk about insights from my books. I've explained how the first book came about. Maybe uh, just to unpack a bit the thesis that I wrote, it was about things I'm passionate about. I said I hate inequality, but I hate gender bias even more. So when I did a doctorate, sorry, I didn't need it. I was just doing it for fun. So it was important to find something that I was passionate about. And gender issues mean a lot to me. So I chose to look at women that had succeeded in breaking the glass ceiling or whatever you want to call it. And I wanted to find out because as an African woman, I'm at the bottom of the pile. So if we don't define the social identities of privilege or underprivilege, it's easy to just use one brush for women and yet they're so different. So I chose to look at three social identities, gender, race, and social class. And social class is very important. For a very long time, it was race but social class is becoming even more important now. So I wanted to find the intersection of those three social identities in the career progression of those women that had done well. I also wanted to find out from them what are the strategies for gender transformation at leadership level. It doesn't matter how patriarchal you are. It's common sense that if you have 100 human beings and only 12 of them have the privilege to lead, that's mediocrity. If out of 100 people, each one knows, if I pull my weight, I have an opportunity to lead, guess what? You actually are firing from all cylinders. But we don't do that in the world. We don't do that in the country, so that's why I was so interested to understand. So the first book unpacks the journeys of the women that I interviewed. But not only that, there are two men covered in the book. One of them is Cyril Ramaphosa, and the other one is a guy that I sat on the board with uh, at Anglo-American PLC. The reason I put those men is because when I interviewed the women for the thesis and the book, because some of the women didn't want to be in the book, so I interviewed more women than I have in the book, quite a lot of them said, I am where I am because Cyril believed in me. I didn't put him in the book because he was deputy president of the country then. I put him in the book because he empowered some of the women that I interviewed. And I wanted, I believe in a carrot more than a stick. And a carrot is when you put someone on a pedestal because they're doing things right, everyone looks at it and say, I can outdo him. So that is why I did that. For the second book, I had to balance 
what I did in the first book and have more men. So I have 10 men in the second book and two women. One of the men in the book is my husband. Not because he's my husband, but because as a person, he's done well at a personal level. He's done well for his family and he continues to do something bigger than himself to make a difference in the lives of other people everywhere. So those are just a few insights, starting with this one. Family is everything. I mean that most sincerely. As explained earlier, my parents made me who I am. My husband is my best friend. He's my mentor. When things are really bad, I know I can rely on him. So family is everything. But this is not just my view. It's the view of everyone that I interviewed, whether they're in the book or they're not in the book. What do I mean by family? With the scourge of HIV AIDS, which has, uh, it's not as bad as it used to be, it's still there, but there was a period where we wasted time and were in denial. During that period, a lot of people died. As a result, as a country, we have a lot of orphans from HIV and AIDS. So when I say family, someone might say, who's family for me? I don't have parents. In an African setting, you don't have to be a blood relative. But that person, that significant other, that person who guides you, that's family. And that support is key on who you become. That support you have to nurture. Don't take family relationships for granted because they do define in some way the person that you become. I chose four people from the book. I deliberately didn't choose Sizwef because you'd be like, okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, I spoke, I interviewed uh, Fred Swanike. He is the leader of African Leadership Academy. He has achieved quite a bit uh, in his life. I think he's, he is in his early 40s. He was mentioned as one of the top 100 innovators, time, 20 and Forbes. Uh, so I wanted to find out from him his life story, his life journey. I wanted to put him on a pedestal so that an African child can look at him and say, I can do this. So what did I gain from that conversation? Quite a lot of things, but one of them is culture. Culture in an organization. And how did this come about? I have watched him. I think it's 12 years now that he started African Leadership Academy, which is somewhere here in Joburg. He then started uh, the university in Mauritius. Then he started another one in Rwanda, and is, I think, maybe Nigeria soon. I've been to all the institutions. And if you closed your eyes and opened them in each one, it's the same thing. So I wanted to find out, because one of the secrets of success in business, being able to scale your business, is actually churning out the same. You know when you go to a restaurant? The restaurants that stay with you all the time are those that give you exactly what you came for over and over again. Consistency. Now, how do you maintain a culture, no matter where you are in the world? The same culture, consistency, excellence at all times. His take was that he interviews the first 100 employees himself. 
because one of the things he's learned is that when I was younger, I thought if you put together a team, you look at the skills required to make it as a business. You need a lawyer, you need a CA, and so forth. But there is more to it than that. It's the culture, it's your ethic, what drives you. Is there a fit? Is there a cultural fit with your way of doing things and just the person that you are? And he says, over time he's learned that a cultural fit in a prospective employee is bigger than just being good at interviews. How many of you have noticed how what people are on paper and who they really are, chalk and cheese. Some people are so good at interviews, they, you know, they just, it's like, oh my God, this person can walk on water till you actually have to live and work with them. So you have to devise a way of making an environment that allows you to see this person interacting with other people, which is one of the things that he does. Earlier I spoke about relationships. <coughs> relationships are so important. A trusting relationship is sustainable. A trusting relationship allows you to form bonds that are beyond just work because you trust this person, you respect this person, and it depends on how they carry themselves as to why you actually trust them. Here is the thing that is so important. You know how we spend dinner, table, chats about how bad things are, criticizing everything, a lot of energy, negative energy. And then we don't actually look at ourselves and say, you know what, they are messing up, but I'm doing my bit. So I think as a country, it's important for us to say, I have a role to play in this society. This is my country and I'll be one of those that will build it. I'll be one of those that will have integrity. I'll be one of those that will go to the townships because one of the other things, those that have succeeded, that now can live in Sentin, think their life starts and ends in Sentin, and it so doesn't. We so have to invest in where we come from those communities that nurtured you, that allowed you to now live in Sentin. We need to go back to those communities and make a difference. And it doesn't have to be because you've made money, because you've lived so long, then you, every age, every stage, there is something to give back. Even as a student, a learner in high school, you find that you are so good at certain subjects Help other kids that are not good at that. Live your life as an example. So each one of us has a role to play. And I like this one. We have so many graduates that are unemployed. And sometimes you say, I have a big home. So the only job I'm going to take is the one that I'm qualified for. You know what? Life doesn't work that way. Just that, be a waitress, anything, volunteer, because you learn so much and you meet so many people when you do that. So, because I'm gender correct, <laughs> I have two men and two women. And the two women that I've covered, it's quite interesting because they have a different way of trying to solve for the gender inequality. I'm sure a lot of you know Domato Gloria Sirobe, right? 
There is a lot that's good about her and exemplary. Women investment portfolio is still standing 26 years later. That is amazing. Let's clap for her. Thank you. She is the only woman owned, or at least her company is the only woman owned company, black, white, red, orange, that listed on the JSE. You need to be ambitious amongst a lot of other things to be able to do that. So I put her on a pedestal because I say to an African child, you can do this, right? But the other thing that I find interesting, she, if you look at what I've written here, that young women should be preoccupied about how we change the status quo when it comes to leadership. And you'll see the slight difference with the next woman that I cover. Again, she talks about enabling environments. That's key. It doesn't matter where you are. You have to have an enabling environment. The last one, some people would like to call it controversial. I'm quite honest. I call it as I see it. And I don't see it as controversial if I see it as the truth. When we fought apartheid, it was the race thing. And we all were in the trenches together, across color, across gender. But when we fight for gender equity, we are kinder alone. And the one that's at the bottom of the pile happens to look like me and sound like me. And it's not right. Right? Now, Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nuga is the executive director of UN Women. Her approach is different from Domato, only in the sense that Domato talks more about women doing this. Pumzile says, we can't do it alone. And I couldn't agree more. We need each other. The same way we fought apartheid successfully across race and gender, we need to fight gender inequality together. We need men as our allies. We need their support. We need them to open the doors and support us. Because if men love their daughters, the way they say they do. What are they then doing in ensuring that their daughters have a fair chance of running this country, of running a JSC listed companies? So I think the mindset has to change that we together have to change the status quo because the growth of this economy lies in making sure that each person has an equal chance of making it. And culture evolves, and we are the custodians of culture. Unless we kill toxic masculinity, unless we kill a patriarchal way of looking at things and doing things, we will be mediocre, our kids and their kids, in perpetuity. The last person I cover, which is one of the insights from the book, is Ali Mufaruki, who is from Tanzania. And he says, live a life of significance. He actually left his country and went to Germany to study engineering. He had a brilliant job at Daimler Chrysler because the thesis that he did made sense to Daimler Chrysler. He went as an intern, he got a job, and he actually rose through the ranks. He made 
had currency money that you were sending home. One day you woke up and said, if I, I didn't wake up, I wouldn't be missed. Because in a bigger scheme of things, Germany doesn't need me, but Tanzania does. And he came back home. And everyone was so disappointed that, really, you are sending us money. You come back, he had to wait for six months for his car to be shipped uh, to, so he was walking to work. That is commitment of a purpose that's bigger than yourself. You might have wanted me to cover more on my own journey. I'm happy to answer questions if that's one of the things you'd like to do. But that's the end of the presentation I had prepared for you. Thank you.